Book Ten, Part One of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons. The Aeneid by Publius Vergilius Maro, translated by John Dryden. Book Ten, The Death of Princes, Part One. The gates of heaven unfold. Jove summons all the gods to council in the common hall. Sublimely seated he surveys from far the fields, the camp, the fortune of the war, and all the inferior world. From first to last the sovereign senate in degrees are placed. Then thus the almighty sire began. Ye gods, natives or denizens of blessed abodes, from whence these murmurs and this change of mind, this backward fate from what was first designed. Why this protracted war, when my commands pronounced a peace, and gave the Latian lands? What fear or hope on either part divides our heavens, and arms our powers on different sides? A lawful time of war at length will come, nor need your haste anticipate the doom, when Carthage shall contend the world with Rome, shall force the rigid rocks and alpine chains, and like a flood come pouring on the plains, then is your time for faction and debate, for partial favour and permitted hate. Let now your immature dissension cease, sit quiet, and compose your souls to peace. Thus Jupiter in few unfolds the charge, but lovely Venus thus replies at large, O oh, power immense, eternal energy, for to what else protection can we fly? Seest thou the proud Rutulians, how they dare in fields unpunished, and insult my care. How lofty Turnus vaunts amid his train, in shining arms triumphant on the plain. Even in their lines and trenches they contend, and scarce their walls the Trojan troops defend. The town is filled with slaughter, and o'erfloats with a red deluge their increasing moats. Aeneas, ignorant and far from thence, has left a camp exposed without defence, this endless outrage shall they still sustain? Shall Troy renewed be forced and fired again? A second siege my banished issue fears, and a new Diomede in arms appears. One more audacious mortal will be found, and I, thy daughter, wait another wound. Yet if with fates averse, without thy leave, the Latian lands my progeny receive, bear they the pains of violated law, and thy protection from their aid withdraw. But if the gods their sure success foretell, if those of heaven consent with those of hell to promise Italy, who dare debate the power of Jove or fix another fate? What should I tell of tempests on the main, of earless usurping Neptune's reign, of Iris sent with Bacchanalian heat to inspire the matrons and destroy the fleet? Now Juno to the Stygian sky descends, solicits hell for aid, and arms the fiends. That new example wanted yet above, an act that well became the wife of Jove. Alecto, raised by her, with rage inflames the peaceful bosoms of the Latian dames. Imperial sway no more exalts my mind. Such hopes I had, indeed, while heaven was kind. Now let my happier foes possess my place, whom Jove prefers before the Trojan race, and conquer they whom you with conquest grace, since you can spare from all your wide command no spot of earth, no hospitable land which may my wandering fugitives receive, since haughty Juno will not give you leave. Then, father, if I still may use that name, by ruined Troy, yet smoking from the flame, I beg you, let Ascanius by my care be freed from danger and dismiss the war. Inglorious let him live, without a crown. The father may be cast on coasts unknown, struggling with fate. But let me save the son. Mine is Cythera, mine the Cyprian towers. In those recesses and those sacred bowers obscurely let him rest his right resign to promised empire and his Julian line. Then Carthage may the Ausonian towns destroy, nor fear the race of a rejected boy. What profits it, my son, to scape the fire, 
armed with his gods and loaded with his sire, to pass the perils of the seas and wind, evade the Greeks and leave the war behind, to reach the Italian shores, if, after all, our second Pergamus is doomed to fall. Much better had he curbed his high desires, and hovered o'er his ill-extinguished fires, to Simois' banks the fugitives restore, and give them back to war and all the woes before. Deep indignation swelled Saturnia's heart. And must I own, she said, my secret smart, what with more decence were in silence kept, and but for this unjust reproach had slept. Did God or man your favourite son advise with war unhoped the Latians to surprise? By fate you boast, and by the gods' decree he left his native land for Italy. Confess the truth. By mad Cassandra, more than heaven inspired, he sought a foreign shore. Did I persuade to trust his second Troy to the raw conduct of a beardless boy, with walls unfinished, which himself forsakes, and through the waves a wandering voyage takes? When have I urged him meanly to demand the Tuscan aid and arm a quiet land? Did I or Iris give this mad advice? or made the fool himself the fatal choice. You think it hard the Latians should destroy with swords your Trojans, and with fires your Troy. Hard and unjust indeed for men to draw their native air, nor take a foreign law. That Turnus is permitted still to live, to whom his birth a god and goddess give but yet is just and lawful for your line to drive their fields and force with fraud to join. Realms, not your own, among your clans divide, and from the bridegroom tear the promised bride. Petition while you public arms prepare, pretend a peace and yet provoke a war. T'was given to you your darling son to shroud, to draw the dastard from the fighting crowd, and for a man obtend an empty cloud. From flaming fleets you turned the fire away, and changed the ships to daughters of the sea. But is my crime, the Queen of Heaven offends if she presume to save her suffering friends. Your son, not knowing what his foes decree, you say, is absent. Absent let him be. Yours is Cythera, yours the Cyprian towers, the soft recesses and the sacred bowers. Why do you then these needless arms prepare, and thus provoke a people prone to war? Did I with fire the Trojan town deface, or hinder from return your exiled race? Was I the cause of mischief, or the man whose lawless lust the fatal war began? Think on whose faith the adulterous youth relied, who promised, who procured the Spartan bride, when all the United States of Greece combined to purge the world of the perfidious kind, then was your time to fear the Trojan fate. Your quarrels and complaints are now too late. Thus Juno. Murmurs rise with mixed applause, just as they favour or dislike the cause. So winds, when yet unfledged in woods they lie, In whispers first their tender voices try, Then issue on the main with bellowing rage, And storms to trembling mariners presage. Then thus to both replied the imperial god, Who shakes heaven's axles with his awful nod. When he begins the silent senate, Stand with reverence listening to the dread command, The clouds dispel, the winds their breath restrain and the hushed waves lie flatted on the main. Celestials, your attentive ears incline. Since, said the god, the Trojans must not join in wished alliance with the Latin line, since endless jarrings and immortal hate tend but to discompose our happy state, the war henceforward be resigned to fate. Each to his proper fortune stand or fall, equal and unconcerned I look on all. Rutulians, Trojans are the same to me, and both shall draw the lots their fates decree. Let these assault, if fortune be their friend, and if she favours those, let those defend. The fates will find their way. 
the thunderer said, and shook the sacred honours of his head, attesting Styx, the inviolable flood, and the black regions of his brother God. Trembled the poles of heaven, and earth confessed the nod. This end the sessions had. The senate rise, and to his palace wait their sovereign through the skies. Meantime, intent upon their siege, the foes within their walls the Trojan host enclose. They wound, they kill, they watch at every gate, renew the fires and urge their happy fate. The Aeneans wish in vain their wanted chief, hopeless of flight, more hopeless of relief. Thin on the towers they stand, and even those few, a feeble, fainting, and dejected crew. Yet in the face of danger some there stood, the two bold brothers of Sarpedon's blood, Asius and Acmon, both the Asarachi, young Hemon, and though young, resolved to die. With these were Clarus and Thymoites joined, Tibris and Castor, both of Lycian kind. From Acmon's hands a rolling stone there came, so large it half deserved a mountain's name. Strong sinewed was the youth, and big of bone. His brother Nestus could not more have done, or the great father of the intrepid son. Some firebrands throw, some flights of arrows send, and some with darts, and some with stones defend. Amid the press appears the beauteous boy, the care of Venus, and the hope of Troy. His lovely face unarmed, his head was bare, in ringlets o'er his shoulders hung his hair. His forehead circled with a diadem, Distinguished from the crowd, he shines a gem enchased in gold, or polished ivory set, amidst the meaner foil of sable jet. Nor Ismarus was wanting to the war, directing pointed arrows from afar, and death with poison armed, in Lydia born, where plenteous harvests the fat fields adorn, where proud Pactolus floats the fruitful lands and leaves a rich manure of golden sands. There Capis, author of the Capuan name, and there was Mnestheus, too, increased in fame since Turnus from the camp he cast with shame. Thus mortal war was waged on either side. Meantime the hero cut the nightly tide, for, anxious from Evander when he went, he sought the Tyrian camp and Tarchon's tent, exposed the cause of coming to the chief, his name and country told, and asked relief proposed the terms, his own small strength declared, what vengeance proud Mesentius had prepared, what Turnus, bold and violent, designed, then showed the slippery state of humankind and fickle fortune, warned him to beware, and to his wholesome counsel added prayer. Tarchon without delay the treaty signs, and to the Trojan troops the Tuscan joins. They soon set sail, nor now the fates withstand, their forces trusted with a foreign hand. Aeneas leads, upon his stern appear two lions carved, which rising Ida bear, Ida to wandering Trojans ever dear. Under their grateful shade Aeneas sat, revolving war's events and various fate. His left young Pallas kept, fixed to his side, and oft of winds inquired and of the tide, oft of the stars and of their watery way, and what he suffered both by land and sea. Now, sacred sisters, open all your spring. The Tuscan leaders and their army sing, which followed great Aeneas to the war. Their arms, their numbers, and their names declare. A thousand youths brave Massicus obey, born in the tiger through the foaming sea from Asium brought, and Cosa by his care. For arms, light quivers, bows, and shafts they bear. Fierce Abbas next, his men bright armour wore, his stern Apollo's golden statue bore. Six hundred Populonia sent along, all skilled in martial exercise and strong. Three hundred more for battle Ilva joins, an isle renowned for steel and unexhausted mines. As Silas on his prow the third appears, who heaven interprets and the wandering stars, from offered entrails prodigies expounds, and peals of thunder with presaging sounds, a thousand spears in warlike order stand, sent by the Pisans under his command. Fair Astur follows in the watery field, 
proud of his managed horse and painted shield. Graviska, noisome from the neighbouring fen, and his own Caere sent three hundred men, with those which Minio's fields and Pergi gave, all bred in arms, unanimous and brave. Thou, muse, the name of Siniras renew, and brave Cupavo, followed but by few, whose helm confessed the lineage of the man, and bore with wings displayed a silver swan. Love was the fault of his famed ancestry, whose forms and fortunes in his ensigns fly. For Cycnus loved unhappy Phaeton, and sung his loss in poplar groves alone, beneath the sister shades to soothe his grief. Heaven heard his song and hastened his relief, and changed to snowy plumes his hoary hair, and winged his flight to chant aloft in air. His son Cupavo brushed the briny flood, upon his stern a brawny centaur stood, who heaved a rock, and threatening still to throw, with lifted hands alarmed the seas below. They seemed to fear the formidable sight, and rolled their billows on to speed his flight. Ocnus was next, who led his native train of hardy warriors through the watery plain, the son of Manto by the Tuscan stream, from whence the Mantuan town derives the name, an ancient city but of mixed descent, three several tribes compose the government, four towns are under each, but all obey the Mantuan laws and own the Tuscan sway. Hate to Mezentius armed five hundred more, whom Mincius from his sire Benacus bore. Mincius with wreaths of reeds his forehead covered o'er. These grave Auletes leads, a hundred sweep with stretching oars at once the glassy deep. Him and his martial train the triton bears, high on his poop the sea-green god appears, frowning he seems his crooked shell to sound, and at the blast the billows dance around. A hairy man above the waist he shows, a porpoise tail beneath his belly grows, and ends a fish. His breast the waves divides, and froth and foam augment the murmuring tides. Full thirty ships transport the chosen train for Troy's relief, and scour the briny main. Now was the world forsaken by the sun, and Phoebe half her nightly race had run. The careful chief, who never closed his eyes, himself the rudder holds, the sails supplies. A choir of Nereids met him on the flood, once his own galleys, hewn from Ida's wood, but now, as many nymphs, the sea they sweep, as rowed before tall vessels on the deep. They know him from afar, and in a ring enclose the ship that bore the Trojan king. Chimodice, whose voice excelled the rest, above the waves advanced her snowy breast. Her right hand stops the stern, her left divides the curling ocean and corrects the tides. She spoke for all the choir, and thus began with pleasing words to warn the unknowing man. Sleeps our loved lord? O oh, goddess-born, awake! Spread every sail, pursue your watery track, and haste your course! Your navy once were we, from Ida's height descending to the sea, till Turnus, as at anchor fixed we stood, presumed to violate our holy wood. Then, loosed from shore, we fled his fires profane, unwillingly we broke our master's chain, and since have sought you through the Tuscan main. The mighty mother changed our forms to these, and gave us life immortal in the seas. But young Ascanius in his camp distressed by your insulting foes is hardly pressed. The Arcadian horsemen and Etrurian host advance in order on the Latian coast. To cut their way the Dornian chief designs before their troops can reach the Trojan lines. Thou, when the rosy morn restores the light, first arm thy soldiers for the ensuing fight. Thyself the fated sword of Vulcan wield, and bear aloft the impenetrable shield. Tomorrow's sun, unless my skill be vain, shall see huge heaps of foes in battle slain. Parting, she spoke, and with immortal force pushed on the vessel in her watery course, for well she knew the way. Impelled behind, the ship flew forward and outstripped the wind. The rest make up. Unknowing of the cause, the chief admires their speed, and happy omens draws. 
Then thus he prayed, and fixed on heaven his eyes. Hear thou, great mother of the deities, with turrets crowned, on Ida's holy hill fierce tigers, reined and curved, obey thy will. Firm thy own omens, lead us on to fight, and let thy Phrygians conquer in thy right. He said no more, and now renewing day had chased the shadows of the night away. He charged the soldiers with preventing care their flags to follow and their arms prepare, warned of the ensuing fight, and bade them hope the war. Now his lofty poop he viewed below his camp encompassed and the enclosing foe. His blazing shield embraced he held on high, the camp received the sign and with loud shouts reply. Hope arms their courage, from their towers they throw their darts with double force and drive the foe. Thus at the signal given the cranes arise before the stormy south and blacken all the skies. King Turnus wondered at the fight renewed, till looking back the Trojan fleet he viewed. The seas with swelling canvas covered o'er, and the swift ships descending on the shore. The Latians saw from far with dazzled eyes the radiant crest that seemed in flames to rise, and dart diffusive fires around the field, and the keen glittering of the golden shield. Thus threatening comets, when by night they rise, shoot sanguine streams, and sadden all the skies. So Sirius flashing forth sinister lights, pale humankind with plagues and with dry famine fright. Yet Turnus with undaunted mind is bent to man the shores and hinder their descent, and thus awakes the courage of his friends. What you so long have wished kind fortune sends, in ardent arms to meet the invading foe, you find and find him at advantage now. Yours is the day, you need but only dare, your swords will make you masters of the war. Your sires, your sons, your houses and your lands, and dearest wives, are all within your hands. Be mindful of the race from whence you came, and emulate in arms your father's fame. Now take the time, while staggering yet they stand, with feet unfirm, and prepossess the strand. Fortune befriends the bold. No more he said, but balanced whom to leave and whom to lead. Then these elects, the landing to prevent, and those he leaves to keep the city pent. Meantime the Trojan sends his troops ashore. Some are by boats exposed, by bridges more. With labouring oars they bear along the strand, where the tide languishes, and leap a land. Tarchon observes the coast with careful eyes, and where no fault he finds, no water fries nor billows with unequal murmurs roar, but smoothly slide along and swell the shore. That course he steered, and thus he gave command. Here ply your oars, and at all hazard land, force on the vessel that her keel may wound this hated soil, and furrow hostile ground. Let me securely land, I ask no more, then sink my ships, or shatter on the shore. This fiery speech inflames his fearful friends, they tug at every oar and every stretcher bends. They run their ships aground, the vessels knock thus forced ashore, and tremble with the shock. Tarkon's alone was lost, that stranded stood, stuck on a bank and beaten by the flood. She breaks her back, the loosened sides give way, and plunge the Tuscan soldiers in the sea. Their broken oars and floating planks withstand their passage while they labour to the land, and ebbing tides bear back upon the uncertain sand. Now Turnus leads his troops without delay, advancing to the margin of the sea. The trumpets sound. Aeneas first assailed the clowns new raised and raw, and soon prevailed. Great Theron fell, an omen of the fight. Great Theron, large of limbs of giant height. He first in open field defied the prince, but armour scaled with gold was no defence against the fated sword, which opened wide his plated shield, and pierced his naked side. Next Lycas fell, who, not like others born, was from his wretched mother ripped and torn, sacred, O Phoebus, from his birth to thee, for his beginning life from biting steel was free. Not far from him was Gaius laid along, of monstrous bulk, 
with Kisseus fierce and strong. Vain bulk and strength, for when the chief assailed, nor valour nor Herculean arms availed, nor their famed father wont in war to go with great Alcides when he toiled below. The noisy Pharos next received his death. Aeneas writhed his dart and stopped his bawling breath. Then wretched Sidon had received his doom, who courted Clytius in his beardless bloom, and sought with lust obscene polluted joys. The Trojan sword had cured his love of boys, had not his seven bold brethren stopped the course of the fierce champions with united force. Seven darts were thrown at once, and some rebound from his bright shield, some on his helmet sound. The rest had reached him, but his mother's care prevented those, and turned aside in air. The prince then called Achates to supply the spears that knew the way to victory. Those fatal weapons which inured to blood in Grecian bodies under Ilium stood, not one of those my hand shall toss in vain against our foes on this contended plain, he said, then seized a mighty spear and threw, which, winged with fate, through Mion's buckler flew, pierced all the brazen plates, and reached his heart. He staggered with intolerable smart. Alcanor saw, and reached, but reached in vain, his helping hand, his brother to sustain, a second spear which kept the former course from the same hand and sent with equal force his right arm pierced, and holding on bereft his use of both and pinioned down his left. Then Numitor from his dead brother drew the ill omen spear and at the Trojan threw. Preventing fate directs the lance away, which glancing only marked Achates' thigh. In pride of youth the Sabine Clausus came, and from afar at Dryops took his aim. The spear flew hissing through the middle space, and pierced his throat, directed at his face. It stopped at once the passage of his wind, and the free soul to flitting air resigned. His forehead was the first that struck the ground. Life-blood and life rushed mingled through the wound. He slew three brothers of the Borean race, and three whom Ismarus, their native place, had sent to war, but all the sons of Thrace. Helesus next the bold Aurunki leads. The son of Neptune to his aid succeeds, conspicuous on his horse. On either hand these fight to keep, and those to win, the land. With mutual blood the Arsonian soil is dyed, while on its borders each their claim decide. As wintry winds contending in the sky, with equal force of lungs their titles try. They rage, they roar, the doubtful rack of heaven stands without motion, and the tide undriven. Each bent to conquer, neither side to yield. They long suspend the fortune of the field. Both armies thus perform what courage can, foot set to foot, and mingled man to man. But in another part the Arcadian horse with ill success engaged the Latin force, for where the impetuous torrent rushing down huge craggy stones and rooted trees had thrown, they left their courses, and unused to fight on foot were scattered in a shameful flight. Pallas, who with disdain and grief had viewed his foes pursuing, and his friends pursued, used threatenings mixed with prayers his last resource, with these to move their minds, and those to fire their force. Which way, companions? Whither would you run? By you yourselves and mighty battles won, by my great sire, by his established name, and early promise of my future fame, by my youth, emulous of equal right to share his honours, shun ignoble flight. Trust not your feet, your hands must hew way through yon black body and that thick array. Tis through that forward path that we must come, there lies our way and that our passage home. Nor powers above nor destinies below oppress our arms, with equal strength we go, with mortal hands to meet a mortal foe. See on what foot we stand. A scanty shore, the sea behind, our enemies before. No passage left unless we swim the main, or, forcing these, the Trojan trenches gain. This said, 
he strode with eager haste along and bore amidst the thickest of the throng largus the first he met with fate to foe had heaved a stone of mighty weight to throw stooping the spear descended on his chine just where the bone distinguished either loin it stuck so fast so deeply buried lay that scarce the victor forced the steel away his bond came on but while he moved too slow to wish to revenge the prince prevents his blow for warding his at once at once he pressed and plunged the fatal weapon in his breast then lewd and chemilus he laid in dust who stained his stepdam's bed with impious lust and after him the daucian twins were slain laris and thimbrus on the latian plain so wondrous like in feature shape and size as caused an error in her parents eyes grateful mistake but soon the sword decides the nice distinction and their fate divides for thimbrus head was lopped and laris hand dismembered sought its owner on the strand the trembling fingers yet the photian strain and threaten still the intended stroke in vain now to renew the charge the arcadians came sight of such acts and sense of honest shame and grief with anger mixed their minds in flame then with a casual blow was roetius slain who chanced as pallas threw to cross the plain the flying spear was after ilus sent but roetius happened on a death unmeant from Toithras and from Tyres, while he fled, the lance athwart his body laid him dead. Rolled from his chariot with a mortal wound, and intercepted fate, he spurned the ground, as when in summer welcome winds arise, the watchful shepherd to the forest flies and fires the midmost plants. Contagion spreads, and catching flames infect the neighbouring heads. Around the forest flies the furious blast, and all the leafy nation sinks at last, and Vulcan rides in triumph o'er the waste. The pastor, pleased with his dire victory, beholds the satiate flames in sheets ascend the sky. So Pallas' troops their scattered strength unite, and pouring on their foes their prince delight. Halesus came, fierce with desire of blood, but first collected in his arms he stood, Advancing then, he plied the spear so well, Ladon, Demodocus, and Pheres fell. Around his head he tossed his glittering brand, And from Strymonius hewed his better hand, Held up to guard his throat, Then hurled a stone at Toas, ample front, And pierced the bone. It struck beneath the space of either eye, And blood and mingled brains together fly. Deep skilled in future fates, Halesus' sire did with the youth to lonely groves retire. But when the father's mortal race was run, dire destiny laid hold upon the son, and hauled him to the war, to find, beneath the Evandrian spear, a memorable death. Pallas the encounter seeks, but ere he throws, to Tuscan Tiber thus addressed his vows. O oh, sacred stream, direct my flying dart, and give to pass the proud Halesus' heart. His arms and spoils thy holy oak shall bear. Pleased with the bribe, the god received his prayer, for while his shield protects a friend distressed, the dart came driving on and pierced his breast. But Lausus, no small portion of the war, permits not panic fear to reign too far, caused by the death of so renowned a knight, but by his own example cheers the fight. Fierce Abbas first he slew, Abbas, the stay of Trojan hopes and hindrance of the day. The Phrygian troops escaped the Greeks in vain. They and their mixed allies now load the plain. To the rude shock of war both armies came, their leaders equal and their strength the same. The rear so pressed the front they could not wield their angry weapons to dispute the field. Here Pallas urges on, and Lausus there, of equal youth and beauty both appear, but both by fate forbid to breathe their native air. Their congress in the field great Jove withstands, both doomed to fall, but fall by greater hands. End of Book 10, Part 1